I would like to call the uh, January 20, 2021 virtual meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 regular meeting to order. Uh, Mary, may I have a roll call, please? Yes. Jellwick? Peyton Hall? Here. Figueroa? Here. Rigo? Here. Ramirez? Team Paul Pong? Wiedemann? Here. All right, we do have a quorum. Um, I didn't hear Patty or uh, Kit. I think they'll be joining us again, but let's uh, proceed. Um, you can please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, for all. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, James, could you please read our Fenton mission beliefs and uh, Bison Way statements? Absolutely. Fenton mission statement to cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engage learning. School and home collaborate effectively. We provide a safe, secure, and caring environment. We infuse social emotional learning into academics and culture. Diversity empowers our learning community. We prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibility. The Bison Way, students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, empathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together, and hold each other to high expectation to become the leaders and innovators of the future. All right, thank you, James. Now we move on to my favorite part, recognitions. Uh, James, if you could take that. Absolutely, my favorite part as well. The Chicago Bears continue to be impressed with Fenton High School. The two outstanding young men you saw last month decides to utilize their new connection and, and they motivated a very deserving Fenton teacher for a different Chicago Bears community outreach program. As you'll see in the video, Mr. George McCaskey of the Bears ownership made a surprise visit to present Miss Kelly Mullins with the Chicago Bears Classroom Champion Award. Then you'll see a video from Miss Kate Ward, the division leader who works with Miss Mullins every day. She will share a heartfelt congratulation that is echoed by everyone on our staff. But as I said, I have someone on here. Uh, Mr. George McCaskey, who I'm sure you want to hear from more than me, but we are both obviously from this. Um, I am from the Chicago Bears Community Relations Department. I brought him along to talk about a special program that we have. So I'm going to kick it over to him. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. And is it um, Principal, I want to make sure I pronounce your name, Lazarevich? Is that how you say it? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, allowing us to join this call. So Ms. Mullins, um, the Bears have a uh, program called Classroom Champions. And the whole idea of the program is to nominate outstanding teachers in the Chicagoland area. And we get uh, nominations from all over the place, from present students, former students, fellow teachers, principals, administrators, parents, and um, we're very excited about the program because it's just a wonderful idea, um, we think, to honor these people that give so much of themselves um, for our future leaders. And um, we got a nomination um, from a couple of students at Fenton High School 
And uh, first of all, I want to say we love your um, school colors. The blue is a little bit off, but um, I totally agree, that, sir. Totally uh, we agree. really like it. And um, not surprised uh, that the leaders of this initiative at Fenton High School uh, are football players for the Bison program. And I want to make sure I'm pronouncing their names correctly. Eric Moreno, Marino? Moreno, yes. Okay. And Nicholas Ben yes, wrote sir. us um, a nomination on behalf of the football team. And they said, among other things, when students are dealing with personal issues, Ms. Mullins makes it clear she will always be there to help support them, provide any assistance needed. It is not uncommon for Ms. Mullins to extend assignment deadlines, lend an ear to listen, or open her heart to show her students she cares about them. She has an amazing way of teaching that gives the students the responsibility, which challenges them through in-depth class discussions and personal reflections. It is truly an honor to have a teacher who constantly wants to connect with her students. The student body at Fenton High School is fortunate to have Ms. Mullins in our lives. And Kelly Mullins, the Chicago Bears could not agree more. And so it is my privilege to inform you that you are a Chicago Bears classroom champion. Congratulations. Wow, thank you so much, Mr. McCaskey. This is really, really, gosh. My principal told me we were coming in to nominate, to give an, you know, to meet with a student. Oh, well, we're happy to be here. And Jackie's got a little bit more information for you about the Classroom Champion Program. Jackie? Yes. So, first of all, congratulations, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. And your name was at the top of our committee list. So it was a resounding yes from everyone. Um, it was an incredible nomination. So the young men who wrote it, um, see, there's a reason that they won the awards they won as well. So we just want to congratulate you. And with that, um, you will be receiving a few gifts. So you will first be receiving a bag. In it will have a hat, mug, lanyards, pens, anything you need for your classroom and to rep your favorite team. Next, we'll be an autograph football from a current player. You oh. can present, or you can put this in your classroom, in your house, wherever you want. You can get a little display case for it. But you will have um, the next thing is you will be having a custom jersey made with your last name on the back <laughs> that you can probably wear every Sunday. Now we play to cheer on your bears. Oh my God. Um, and last but certainly not least, we know that teachers use a lot of their own resources um, for the classroom. And we know that it goes unnoticed a lot of times. So with that, you will be receiving $1,000 for your classroom. Oh, my God. Oh, you guys. Oh, my gosh. So you will be receiving a check, um, a lot smaller, but a lot more valuable than that one. And um, you can use it as you wish for your students in your class. So, yes, yes. As a again, thank you for all you do. And congratulations. Hi, it's Kate Ward. I was so pleased, although not surprised, when I heard that the Chicago Bears had chosen Kelly Mullins as a Chicago Bears classroom champion. As somebody who's worked with Kelly now for close to 15 years, I know that she has always put so much hard work and effort into building relationships with her students, in addition to being a great historian. It was gratifying to hear the words of the students in the letters that they wrote about Kelly, saying that she's a teacher who truly cares about her students and one who makes the classroom a fun place to be. Uh, those perfectly sum up who Miss Mullins is, as, as, who Miss Mullins is as a teacher. Um, the one thing I was a little bit worried about was being part of this surprise. Um, if you know Kelly, you know that she's very sharp and very observant. I knew from the minute that I went to her virtual classroom with Yovan that she knew that we were up to something, and I'm just really happy that she was as happy with the surprise as we were, and that she's still talking to me. So. Kelly, congratulations. You totally deserve this. I'm so happy that the Chicago Bears recognized you and that you were able to hear the way that students feel about you.
Great job. Shout out to Kelly Mullins there. Thank you. Very good. Glad to see that. Thank you for that. Um, and congratulations to uh, Kelly. Uh, we move on to the public comments. Uh, James, do we have any requests for public comments? We have received four public comments, which Dr. Benson will read. Okay. Um, as a reminder, public comments are limited to three minutes per speaker with a limit of 30 minutes per topic. Um, Sam will read the public comments received in chronological order. Uh, Sam? Okay, public comment number one. Greetings, my name is Emma Butts. I am a 2016 alumni of Fenton and a member of the Fenton Advocacy Network. Fan and I have been working diligently to advocate for traditionally marginalized groups who have, are, and will eventually attend Fenton High School. We are going to continue to push the Board of Education to meet the needs of our highly diverse community. We would like to encourage the work we have been putting into our efforts to enhance our community, to be reciprocated by the board. This may look like reaching out to FAN to discuss goals and include us in the conversation to discuss the needs of our school. Our goals are as stated below. We will advocate for traditionally marginalized groups at Fenton High School and provide support to the previously mentioned community wanting to advocate for others. We will provide a voice to those who have been silenced or discouraged by discrimination through various platforms. We will encourage meaningful mandatory equity training among all teaching staff, administration, support staff, et cetera. We will encourage students to engage in workshops that address equity, race, and discrimination conducted by certified professionals. We will actively address the question, are the needs of traditionally marginalized groups being recognized and met? We will discuss current relevant and evolving issues involving justice and equity that affect traditionally marginalized groups. We will not be silenced. We will not, or we will be heard. Our community deserves to be held with high regard and pride. Continuing to dismiss this prominent public outreach would be shameful and cold. Let me leave you with this statement by Sonia Sotomayor. Until you have equal education, we will not have an equal society. Thank you for your time. Public comment number two. My name is Jessica Bengal. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a class of 2016 Fenton alum. To be a diverse high school that yearns for equity and to at the same time ignore the discrimination felt on Fenton's campus is an injustice to our community. This is now our six months submitting public comments to you all and not one of you has reached out to work with us and address our concerns. Since then, other alumni and I have become the Fenton Advocacy Network. We have continued the conversation by sharing stories that serve as testaments to discrimination and inequities at Fenton. We have shared at least 15 stories of discrimination, yet you all display Fenton as pristine and without fault. You have continued to define Fenton with empty accolades and misleading data, yet these stories are very real. They have happened, they are happening. There is no award Fenton could ever attain that could repress or hide the apparent ineffectiveness of the policies in place regarding discrimination. As the board continues to be silent, we recognize that our goals may not be met with the current composition of the board. With that said, I want to highlight the importance of the upcoming board election in April. To those listening and may listen later, your vote is our voice. There are new candidates who are running for positions on board in April. They are each unique, passionate, and driven about transparency and conducting dialogue. The community members voting in the upcoming board election for a multitude of fresh new candidates will be crucial to ensure that the public concerns are taken seriously and that action is taken with the community's input. This current board has ignored us for six months and ignored a petition with 600 alumni, community member signatures calling for the creation and implementation of a diversity action plan. It is up to you to decide 
if the change we all wish to see can actually transpire with the current composition of the board. To the current board, we have not given up. The unfortunate truth is that we have extended the invitation to you every single month. Your silence contributes to the oppression of not only our group, but all students past, present, and future. It's been six months of submitting comments, but the equity journey is everlasting. Thank you. Public comment number three, the following stories are testaments regarding acts of discrimination witnessed or experienced at Fenton High School, which were collected by the Fenton Advocacy Network. These stories shared here and at past board meetings are firsthand accounts of personal experiences that had a meaningful impact on the writers who are sharing them. Please do not infer motivations other than a willingness to share nor assume the identity of any of the participants. These stories are not intended to be accusatory or to imply individual biases. These stories are intended to reflect the greater Fenton experiences of the contributors. These are all submitted anonymous, anonymously. I'm a lesbian student at Fenton High School. My girlfriend and I attended football game one Friday night. Like we usually do, we met up with friends and it was great at first and it got cold. So my girlfriend and I decided to walk to my car to grab a blanket on our way back to the stands near the alleyway. Two male Fenton students were circling around us on their bikes, yelling disgusting at us, pointing to the fact that we were holding hands. I just remember feeling terrified and angry. My girlfriend saw the look on my face and she felt the hopelessness. I did too. As an LGBTQ plus student, it's already hard to try and feel normal as it is, but it's hard to overlook the stares, whispers, and hurtful comments. That night is still stuck with me and discouraged me from feeling comfortable in public. I'm afraid to sub simply wear tight clothes without getting told by another, by other people. Someone said I look like a slut. I don't have the confidence I used to have just because I, what I wear can supposedly define who I am as a person. I wear it because I know I look pretty. I have struggled with mental illness for nearly half a decade now, but this hasn't changed the difficulties I have had as recently as mid-December. I am in extracurriculars and most of the administrators have been kind and patient with my struggles, except one during a one-on-one, -on -one, I was told the administrator did not care for what was going on and they tried to make it seem like my lack of success had been a result of laziness rather than mental illness becoming more severe. The environment at Fenton is everything but understanding of mental illness and other health problems, save for the teachers. The counselors rarely follow up on students whom they know are struggling rather than empathizing with students struggling with body image issues or depression. They look at them like aliens and pretend the students are insane for common issues in the modern day. It's disappointing that the school with more access to funding than schools in Chicago, for example, is managing to meet, mistreat their students far more severely than the school with only one counselor for 300 plus students. I was involved in the Fenton team, and it was an absolute struggle. The team chooses to highlight and praise people who have discriminated others on the team and have also partaken in bullying online. The problem has been brought to staff members and nothing has been done even after asking them to take action. Feels like the staff members don't really care about their competitors, how their competitors feel, but in reality, only care about how well we do. One time a male student was struggling to do something in an extracurricular and a staff member proceeded to say something along the lines of, you can't do it because you are male. This was highly inappropriate for a teacher to say to a student and definitely made others in the room feel uncomfortable. And public comment number four, from Patrick Escobedo, president of the Fenton Educational Association. President Wiedemann and members of the board, 
Greetings and happy new year from the FEA. We hope that this new year brings with it new possibilities for all of you, for our Fenton community and indeed for our country as a whole. The FEA was greatly troubled by the insurrection at the US Capitol a mere two weeks ago. We strongly condemn the violent assault on our democracy itself. Our association is a democratic one and we believe that the democratic process lies at the very heart of our mission as educators. To see an unruly mob attempting to subvert the will of the American people was deeply disturbing and saddening. In particular, the use of hateful white supremacist imagery and ideology during the insurrection is something we fervently reject. We ask the Board of Education to join us in unequivocally condemning the actions of the rioters who assaulted our democracy. And we invite the board to join us in deepening our commitment civic education and equity at Fenton. We strongly believe that education and equity are more vital than ever, and we hope the board does too. In the spirit of pursuing equity in a collaborative manner, we invite the Board of Education and joining our association for a discussion of the podcast, Nice White Parents. We have been listening to the podcast and we will have our next meeting on February 11th at both 7 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. that day to discuss the topics it raises. We welcome the attendance and contributions to the discussion of our Board of Education and hope to see you there. We have to admit we are still somewhat disappointed by the lack of board response to our statements. While it is nice to be thanked for taking the time to make and submit statements, the deeper desire of the association and indeed one which should be shared by the board is for robust and meaningful communication between the board and its stakeholders. The board as a body won't take the time to reach out and follow up with those that submit public comments. May we suggest that individual board members take the initiative to make themselves available. In our current remote learning plan, all teachers have office hours wherein we set aside time to meet with our students to talk about class and work collaboratively on assignments. We encourage members of the board to create a similar office hour space where staff, students, parents, community members can make time to talk with board members and share concerns, ideas, and aspirations for our Fenton community. Making such time would have, I'm sorry, making such time would send a strong message to your stakeholders that you value their concerns and opinions. And we strongly feel it would make the board a more effective governing body. Happy New Year again, and we hope to hear back from you on our statement. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for uh, reading those. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Emma Butts, Jessica Bango, Jamie Menard, and Patrick Escobedo uh, for your input. Thank you all for the comments. We appreciate you taking the time uh, for Fenton High School. Um, now we move on to District 100 informational items. James. Thank you, President, President Wiedemann. Just wanted to also uh, thank the uh, public comments and, uh, and all the folks that sent in their public comments. We are listening. Um, and um, as one of the commenters said, uh, it's a journey to equity. Um, real quickly, a quick preview of District 100 informational item report. We will cover COVID-19 uh, updates, the metrics, vaccination, and learning plan, B, equity report, uh, which would include uh, equity through the lens of finance and budget. Uh, we will discuss uh, equity audit and our DELT team and the action plans. Uh, then we will discuss a training for all of our staff or our certified and non-certified as well as our administrators in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion training, which will, I believe, uh, will start in about a week or two. Lastly, we'll talk about an educational omnibus bill. And lastly, a quick uh, a preview of a negotiation update. So first up <clears throat> is um, COVID-19 updates. Our, our priorities remain the same since March, okay? We, the district has been doing outstanding uh, in regards to the, the three priorities that it's been like a beacon 
uh, for all of our stakeholders, our teachers, our students, uh, and our parents, and uh, the rest of our community members. It's safety and wellness, number one, number two, learning, and number three, communication. Um, I provide the board with uh, the, the metrics every week. Uh, this is the latest metrics from uh, the two-page county public health uh, department. Uh, the two-page remains in substantial community transmission level. Uh, we are more substantial than last week. Um, the trend arrows you see in orange are up. Um, and and it's, it's, it's quite, quite frustrating to see this uh, week to week. Um, but I will do what I normally do at our board meeting here. Let's just go line by line. That first row basically is from the Illinois Department of Public Health uh, Department. It's an orange there with their uh, trend arrow, uh, uh, which is up, uh, which is also considered substantial. New cases per 100,000 per week. We're at 330 per week, uh, which is up from last week. Weekly case count trend. Uh, we are currently in year uh, 2020, so we start off at week one. Last year, we went up to week 53, so I'll re read that uh, real quick. So from week 52 to 53, there was an uptick of 28%. And from week 53 to this new year, week one in 2021, uh, a plus 4% there. Uh, we like that number there. Uh, like everyone else here, it's minimal. Uh, really happy with that. Weekly youth count, less than 20-year-old um, individuals, case count per trend. Week 52 to 53, we saw an increase of plus 40%. Week 53 to week one for 2021, we see a plus 22, substantial uh, with an arrow up. Uh, the weekly test positivity for DuPage is 9.5%, which is up from last week. I believe is what 9.2, which puts us in a substantial and our neighboring regional indicators is stable um, there. Uh, at this moment, region eight has been moved. Um, and I, I don't know why they didn't update this, but yesterday we have had message from the governor that we're in tier two mitigation, which really doesn't affect uh, the school too much. Um, it affects mostly um, uh, restaurants, bars, uh, fitness areas and so forth. In, in regards to youth athletics, uh, the, the private um, sectors, it, it, it affects them a little bit there. So this is our metrics from, from the uh, DuPage. Next slide, which we like to see, show here, this is case, uh, COVID case uh, per, per month, per date. Uh, as you could see, that spike uh, was in that November, December, and we're seeing overall, overall, uh, a trend down, which is positive, okay, trend down positive. But if you took it relatively compared to the rest of the graph, we know it's 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 up. That's why we have a positivity rate of, of 9.8 um, in, in DuPage. Um, next slide, please. This is COVID cases per age level from uh, our, our youth, uh, basically from zero to 19 years old, as you can see, uh, the red 15 and 19 years old, are they usually track higher uh, in regards to COVID cases, followed by uh, 5 to 14 and um, our pre preschoolers at 0 to 4, um, uh, their cases are much lower than the other groups you see there. Here's another graph, another graph, if you don't like, uh, um, this is more of, of a bar graph in regards to age from 0 to 4 from the far left highest from ages 15 to 19. Kind of the same sort of infra, uh, trend that we've been seeing in that age group for the last couple of months now. A little closer to home, uh, this is Wooddale numbers. Last 14 days, positivity rate is 8.92. Set last seven days is 8.21, um, above 8%. And Bensonville, uh, uh, last 14 days is at 7.93. Uh, last seven days is at 7.8. Uh, before we went on our winter break, uh, we announced to our community, to the board, that, hey, look, we're preparing for a hybrid sometime when we come back, uh, when it's safe, uh, when we're out of substantial, and we want to know 
uh, from our parents and students who would choose to go in hybrid and who would, who chose to go in remote. Um, here are the scorecard as of today. Um, we put two weeks of, of survey. Um, we even extended it a couple more days and we're accepting folks if they're coming in a little bit late, uh, if, they, if there are some um, uh, 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 strenuating uh, si uh, situation at home. So right there, you get it. Uh, 338 families chose hybrid, and about 1,100 chose remote. Was this a was it parent response or student response? It was a parent response. Okay. We needed Thank to you. hear from the parents. Thanks. In regards to exciting news here, very very excited. Uh, as you know, vaccination uh, has landed in DuPage. Uh, both Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines are here. Um, approximately two weeks ago, uh, the superintendents of DuPage was given a call from the DuPage County Public Health and the Regional Office of Education, basically stating, hey, look, we would like to distribute um, vaccines at your, at your sites, Fenton being one of them. Most, most, most of the sites are high school. Um, uh, setting, um, and we move aggressively to be one of the first, hopefully, providers. Um, we did a lot of legwork, a lot of phone calls in regards to that. Fenton has two partners as of today in regards to vaccination, okay, and that's um, Jewel Osco uh, Pharmacy in Bensonville and Elmer's Hospital, okay. Those are the two healthcare providers that we have contacted and say, hey, look, when you get the drugs, we would like to, for your agency uh, to vaccinate our staff. Um, we are also joined with District 2, um, um, Bensonville, and Wooddale District 7. Uh, so the three district, the tri-district, uh, will converge at Fenton to receive their vaccination for their staff. Really looking forward to that. Great conversation. Boy, Jewel Osco Pharmacy in Bensonville is just outstanding. Shout out to them. Real easy to work with. Answered my question. I answered her question in regards to that. Same thing with Elmer's Hospital. Just an outstanding organization. Very uh, easy to work with. So what are we waiting for? We are wait, basically waiting for uh, the vaccines to arrive uh, at the DuPage County Public Health Department, which is basically uh, uh, the hub that will distribute it to, to the pharmacies or the hospitals. Um, so what are the conversation with these two agencies, the Jewel Osco and Elmer's? You basically talked about uh, facilities, uh, protocols, uh, agreements, insurance coverage. Um, that conversation continues um, and, uh, and, and, and new things arise. So I think the most important thing is identifying uh, who will be our provider and identifying how we're gonna get vaccinated. The vaccine vaccination will take here on our campus. Um, and we'll probably be in the field house. More to come on that. Um, we are just definitely very excited. We believe this is a game changer uh, for, for many good reasons. Uh, had a great conversation with uh, the DuPage County Public Health today. Uh, just real quickly, Group 1A, okay, that's basically your healthcare providers in the hospitals and your long-term staff and, and residents are in Group 1A. They are being vaccinated uh, daily. Uh, DuPage County Public Health has reported they are vaccinating uh, 1,500 individuals per week in DuPage. Uh, there are approximately 58,000 um, uh, individuals in Group 1A. After Group 1A is completed, they group, uh, the, the Public Health Department will move to uh, Group 1B, which includes educators, which includes us uh, in that group. Um, uh, Hot off the presses, uh, our meeting today, uh, it was reported that they are tentatively, they will tentatively start group 1B January 25th. So that's great news. I think we have our ducks uh, in a row here, uh, finding our provider, getting our facilities uh, ready for this to take place. Very, very excited about that. So as it develops, I will continue to report to the board uh, in regards to that. Uh, in regards to that, just uh, another top, co uh, another comment here. We put out a survey to our staff, basically asking who's interested in vaccination and who's not. So we have that that number to provide to our providers. District two and District seven are are doing the same thing. 
Next slide real quick. So what is the Fenton Learning Plan? Due to the COVID DuPage metrics, communication transmission level of substantial, Fenton will continue to follow the recommendation of the DuPage Public Health Department and remain in remote learning. Uh, special population, as you know, uh, which includes kids with connectivity issues, students, uh, our ELLs, English language le learners, special education, uh, or students who just need a place to study are welcome to do their work here at FHS. Um, we have been doing this, I believe, since October, um, and um, we do have students coming in for that. We will continue to collaborate with the DuPage Public Health Department, uh, school districts, uh, and other superintendents um, in DuPage, our staff, obviously our teachers, and uh, we will continue to and monitor the COVID metrics uh, when they uh, come uh, week to week. Any questions there? You shout out again to, to our staff, our teachers, who's, who's really supporting our students day to day. You shout out to our Tommy Cobalt and his um, crew for PPEs as students come in uh, to do their work and keeping our staff here safe uh, from, from, the, from the virus, um, whether it's disinfecting um, and so forth. So um, uh, just real happy uh, of where we're at with that. Uh, moving on to our equity initiatives from a financial perspective, um, just real quickly, we all know equity is a journey, right? Equity has always been a journey here and there's going to be some hiccups. There's going to be some real difficult things to, uh, to, to, to overcome uh, a lot of barriers, uh, but we are committed uh, as a school district. Um, our next topic is about uh, equity. Uh, so far, we have uh, reported how we incorporate equity in our professional development, our, finance, uh, our finances, our student uh, clubs, curriculum, and dean's department with uh, restorative justice last, last month. Uh, this evening, Mr. Mr. Uh, Martin, our chief school business officers, uh, officer, he will discuss how Fenton practices equity through a financial perspective. I mean, here, here's the bottom line. We could talk about equity, but if we don't put where our money, where our mouth is, the, 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 there it's, 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 all, um, it's all talk. So Bruce, the stage is yours. Okay, thanks for that introduction, Mr. Antango. Um, yes, I'm happy to report uh, the equity, equity initiatives from a financial perspective. Um, so equity at Fenton High School, uh, how has Fenton utilized its financial resources to support equity? Um, and then I can also want to uh, emphasize the fact that our annual budget is aligned to support the goals, um, the 2018, uh, the 2021 strategic goals that have with an equity uh, emphasis uh, ingrained in that, uh, those objectives. Um, and as we look at the objectives on this slide, uh, you know, we're charged really with ensuring the teachers have the materials, resources, and training they need to design an equitable classroom. And we provide uh, to provide access to programs and strategies that support the goal of equity and enable all students to succeed. So those are the objectives that we feel that the charge is for us to uh, continue the equity uh, journey at Fenton High School. Um, just to kind of uh, reemphasize, the funding sources within the district, we have low local, state, and funding, uh, federal sources. Uh, federal sources would include grants as well. And the breakout there, the majority of our funding comes from local sources at 89%. State sources are 7 to 10%, and federal sources are 3 to 4%. Um, what are we doing to promote equity in the classroom? Um, you know, this past summer was a pretty robust summer uh, uh, in an unusual summer uh, as, as well, uh, given the fact that we likely kind of had a, had a pretty strong idea we would be starting out the school year um, a little bit differently than what we are accustomed to doing uh, at the beginning of a school year. And as we know, that began uh, in a remote setting. So um, we knew that we had to be prepared for that, wanted to be prepared for that. Our professional learning and growth opportunities um, were in, in full high gear last summer. 
Um, and there was a lot of activities going on. Mrs. Papa Nicolau, I don't think she slept the whole summer. So congratulations, uh, Michelle, to that uh, and those initiatives. And I think really the two winners of that, uh, you know, training uh, really uh, teachers carrying that down to our students. So, and uh, we did have some CARES Act money, federal funding uh, that came to us that uh, to support that remote learning uh, initiative for our, our PD uh, last summer. Uh, experiential learning opportunities such as the Boston STEM trip and Second Story funded through Title I funds. Um, our digital learning platform for all, uh, equal opportunity schools, um, which really emphasize access to rigorous learning, parent involvement through the Highlander Institute, which is a pretty uh, unique and robust program for parents, and then summer school bridge and extension programs. And um, that grew last summer. It'll likely grow even more this summer, those, those programs. Um, continuing on with the equity in the classroom, student support programs, SEL, which is our social emotional learning um, initiatives, um, which include ruler training, uh, castle partnerships to support that initiative, restorative justice, as Mr. Antango just said, our deans presented that uh, topic last uh, month and um, went into great depth about uh, how we're uh, handling discipline um, you know, issues with, with students and, and how that looks so differently now. And uh, we feel, uh, feel we're really on the, on the cutting edge with making some great progress there. Um, bison time really in a, is in essence, a, you know, a resource period for our students daily to, to get uh, extra support uh, from their uh, teachers um, each and every day. I think every day, but Tuesdays during a, a normal uh, traditional school year, but it's still happening even under uh, these, this setting we're in now. Uh, bison Buddies, another support program. Our link crew, uh, which is new this year, uh, but it's really to support our freshman students transitioning into the high school. So. Um, that uh, is kicking off. Uh, it started preliminary work last spring and, and continues on uh, this year. Um, and then some of the activities and clubs that we support um, and, and that are supported by our, uh, our staff and board, 28, uh, six uh, athletic teams and 28 clubs. So a, a pretty good selection. Um, I'd say a very good selection for students to participate in um, throughout the in high school throughout their academic career here. Um, technology, this is, this is obviously a, a critical piece, even more so I would say this year than, than ever before. You know, Mr. Batson talked a little bit earlier this evening about Chromebooks for each student. We're on our eighth year of our program there. So, um, you know, a student, a freshman is issued a Chromebook uh, on day one and then carries that through for his, his or her four years at Fenton. Um, that device, uh, we, we think we have uh, good solid devices that, that are durable. Um, if there is a problem with the device, we have lenders. So we don't, we know how critical that piece of, uh, you know, equipment is uh, for learning and for students uh, to, to progress uh, and for teachers, quite honestly. So uh, we don't want anyone to be, have downtime uh, with, the, with the device that uh, needed some, some attention. Um, our uh, hotspots, um, so students can check these out to the library. Uh, there are no costs. So, um, you know, families that have difficulty connecting to the internet, or don't have internet, or um, for whatever reason uh, need to connect, we have resources for them to, uh, such as hotspots to provide them uh, internet access. Um, we funded offset uh, that fund that expense with CARES Act funding again. Uh, so we participated in a program with the uh, Regional Office of Education that that provided funding for that uh, initiative. And then we also just recently obtained some additional uh, hotspots through T-Mobile, a program there um, that was as a uh, for no cost to the district. So we're, we're pleased to um, be able to support that as well. E-rate funds, I think you've probably heard about this in, in the past and what we do. We're, we're a recipient of uh, funds from the federal government to support um, network infrastructure and connectivity for kids, students. Um, so that really is what uh, we've built our uh, infrastructure with, uh, has been with E-rate funds. So um, another round of that will be coming, I believe, next year. Uh, Jim Batson can speak to that, I think, next month more uh, thoroughly on that. 
but that that's a, a piece that uh, we're, uh, is necessary and we'll continue to uh, build on. Uh, a new program this year, Internet Essentials Program, sponsored by Comcast. It's free broadband to qualifying families. So, um, you know, again, families that are new to Comcast that uh, don't have access uh, and don't currently have internet, um, need internet, they can get it free for a year. Um, there's an application process uh, that they would file through the district, but uh, we sponsor that and, and we're happy to do that. Um, also a number of different software uh, applications, and these are just a few um, that support our educational mission. Uh, we Video, Padlet, Equate.io, Nearpod, uh, Defined Learning, Calendly, um, all these things um, are, are utilized to en enhance and support our educational mission and learning uh, within Fenton. Um, and then we recently um, uh, were granted 50 uh, laptop computers. Uh, Mr. Antanka was instrumental in obtaining those. And uh, we were able to donate them to families that did not have the means or, or, or a device that uh, we were happy to provide to them. So that was a, a great, uh, I think, program. And kudos to Mr. Antanka for making that happen. On the communication front, uh, what are we doing in terms of promoting, uh, you know, our message out there and getting the word out of the programs and resources that we offer at Fenton? Uh, the superintendent's message, the weekly words that come out in, in bilingual fashion. Um, I, I know Gray, uh, James and, and Rick work very hard on, on getting that out every week uh, and, and provided as much information as we possibly can bundle in that, uh, you know, weekly package. Uh, community newsletters across both communities, Wooddale and Bensonville. Uh, we continue to participate in that initiative. And, and uh, you know, we have a pretty prominent role in that in both communities. And, and we're very happy to have that uh, exchange of information with the other uh, communities, uh, taxing bodies in, in the communities. Uh, community newspapers, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, happy. Uh, and I think we've uh, gotten uh, more so in, involved in, in publications and promoting the district and, and what the programs and good things that are happening here um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, a coat drive we participated in, I think this is the second or third year um, with the Rotary. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of that to, uh, you know, pass uh, new coats out to our families that, that are in need and students that, that, that uh, may need a coat. Um, I know many of you are involved in the Northern Illinois food pantry distribution when we have food trucks here and whatnot. I mean, it's a great effort. It's, it's great to see people come out and distribute food. Um, it's unfortunate that the lines are, are as long as they are, but uh, there is a resource and, and we're happy to be a part of that to, to assist with uh, getting uh, you know, food to families that are uh, in need of that. Um, we also pretty regularly um, uh, you know, email, text, voice uh, to our families um, and, and parents and, and, and staff um, to get the word out and, and share that information, uh, whatever it may be uh, related to school information. Um, the Chicago Bears is another communication piece. We just heard about that a little bit earlier uh, with Mrs. Mullins, uh, but our students and staff were recognized through the Bears. And so um, that was a great uh, recognition for Fenton High School. And a couple of other programs here, um, the BPAC program, Padres Unidos, uh, Polish Outreach, um, all those programs are supported with grant funds um, at Fenton High School. And then other supports, um, our Bison Cultural Connection, that's the 21st Century Grant. That is a tremendous program. Um, it's, it's really uh, been uh, spearheaded by a couple of really talented people to um, promote and encourage and, and increase our participation. Um, it's even as challenging as these times have been, we've had good participation with uh, homework help and assistance and SAT support and um, all those types of things. Uh, you know, we some of the programs have been scaled back in the interim, but th that will continue to, to expand as we, as we move forward, such as cooking classes, drama classes, um, you know, field trips and things like that to expose kids to different opportunities. Um, and it's a, just a really a, a great opportunity for kids to partake and all of our students are, have the uh, access to that um, to participate. And that's, that's funded through a, a grant um, 
that is, I think it's in, in its second year, maybe third year this year of, of that. Um, the other thing I know James is very proud of the fact, and as we all are, I suppose, that the meals that we serve to our community, ever since this pandemic has kind of shut us down or tried to shut us down, we still operate, but in a different manner. Um, you know, we've been serving meals seven days a week, and, and I know Mr. Antango was adamant about, no, we're not just going to do it on school days, we're going to do it every day of the week. And we've been doing that since March, um, and that's through the National School Lunch Program. Um, and uh, it, there's no questions asked when kids come in. Uh, it's, it's free to all of our families, our, our students, um, school-age kids. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great program. And it's continuing to, to grow, um, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, the next two items, the fee waivers and student fee analysis, you know, we're taking a look at those things and how we might better serve families and students uh, with how we uh, assess fees and charge fees and collect fees. Um, so we'll continue to uh, evaluate that, uh, likely make some recommendations, bring them forth and uh, keep the board apprised of, of what the status is on, on that and, and where we're going with uh, what we recommend to go forward with that uh, process. And then finally, portrait of a graduate. Again, many of you were very uh, intimately involved in that process that was finished up, I think, last spring. And uh, that's in play, I think, starting now, I believe, right, Mr. Antango? So that's, uh, that's a great uh, program that I know he's uh, worked very hard on uh, making happen. And then, uh, you know, the building facility initiatives, as, as the board knows, the facility assessment uh, audit is in progress. It kind of got a little bit of a hiccup there with, with things, but uh, that uh, is continuing and will continue. Um, and uh, finally, our safety, security, and accessibility. So with, with what's happening now with the whole world and the pandemic and whatnot, um, you know, we think we've made some great uh, improvements to the building uh, with regard to safety, security, accessibility, uh, PPE supplies, uh, temperature readings, um, protocols. Uh, we've worked very hard on that. Kudos to Dr. Benson for, for putting that all together and taking the lead on that. So. Um, that's been a, uh, a challenge, but uh, I think we've met the challenge and, and are continuing to meet it. And then finally, you know, as, as Mr. Antego said at the beginning of the uh, presentation, equity, it, you know, it, it's never ending. It's an ongoing process. And, um, you know, we are, this, I hope, demonstrates some of that. And, and as we go on tonight with some other reports, you'll, you'll hear more about it as it, uh, it continues. So, um, with that, I, I guess I'll turn it over to, I believe, Dr. Benson and Mrs. Uh, Papa Nicolau. Unless you have any questions before we move on from me. So uh, continuing on with our equity report, Dr. Benson and Mrs. Papa Nicolau will provide us an update regarding our district equity leadership team dealt in our upcoming diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Dr. Benson and Mrs. Piccolo, uh, Papa Nicolau, floor is yours. Thanks, James. So uh, just to piggyback on what Bruce was talking about, we are very excited to have our first district equity leadership team meeting with led by Dr. Yvette Dubio um, for this semester. And uh, it happened occurred last Friday. Very vibrant discussion, really good participation about a three hour meeting and uh, really was able to kickstart where we're moving as far as this, this leadership team, which as you recall, it, it's consisted of teachers, um, social workers, uh, guidance counselors and, uh, and administrators, but a, a variety of staff members are involved. And so it's a wide range of, of, of viewpoints and discussions. So very, very, very vibrant. Um, so some of the things that were discussed were, we're moving forward with establishing an equity action plan. That's the term that Dr. Dubio had mentioned. Um, and so that's, we're just in the beginning phases of that, but clearly that's what we want. We want a comprehensive plan for our district. Uh, the, the method, the method of getting there is, to basically break into what, what's called the five systemic strands of equity. It's kind of a well-known 
approach in the equity world where you kind of break down your organization into these five strands. And uh, Dr. Dubiel, as she was leading us through the meeting, allowed the group members to self-select. So we have a nice distribution in these five uh, strands. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to, to where that's, that's going to lead. But this way, what we have is we have uh, a diverse group in, in each category, you know, working specifically in those areas is where it's going to lead to. But when we talk about systems, what we're talking about, how can we advance equity in our policies, our procedures, our decision making? So that's sort of an all over encompassing view. And for example, I know James is in that that uh, strand along with Bruce, Jim Batts, and um, amongst other staff members. But you know, what are we looking at holistically? Then there's also teaching and learning, where it's an equity driven pedagogy. What are we doing instructionally? What are we doing with our assessments? Are we equitable, equitable in our approach? And so that uh, is that strand. Uh, stu third strand is student voice, climate and culture. Pretty self-explanatory. How do we get feedback from our students, input? How do we hear their stories? And, and how do we allow that to create the most positive culture that we can? Professional learning. What kind of opportunities are we providing our staff? And, and we're already in the process of doing this. And, and uh, Ms. Papa Nicolau is going to explain uh, in the next slide kind of what we're doing professionally so our, our all of our staff can be developed and embrace equity. And then finally, we have family and community as agency. So again, how can we engage the community? How can engage our parents and so they can support our students and uh, and our school district. So those five strands, again, equally important. There's not one that's more important than another. Uh, and we got to focus on all of them as we as we move forward on this equity journey, which uh, Dr. Dubio reminded us doesn't have an end point. Um, we're constantly striving. Thanks, Dr. Benton. Thanks, Bruce. Um, that was a great intro to um, how, you know, I just have to say Bruce is great at um, ensuring that we have all the funds that we need to do all of the work that we're doing. And he, he never hesitates at supporting anything that has to do with equity. So um, when he talks about all of those things, he's, he's a key player in ensuring that we have what we need to make that happen. So I just wanted to mention that. And then, uh, Sam, thanks for talking about the DELT process. I think um, part of that, um, you mentioned the strand of professional development, um, you know, is going to be a, a whole action plan. There'll be really deliberate um, next steps. There'll be very deliberate goals that we'll set and how to move forward. Um, in the interim, while, while we are developing those goals and action steps, we thought it was really important to set a, a very solid baseline foundational understanding of what diversity, education, and inclusion means to us as an organization. There's plenty of um, staff members that have been through different kinds of trainings, whether they've been in, in intensive trainings or they've just gone to a workshop. Some of this to be review, especially for our certified staff or certain members of our cert certified staff. But some of this will be new, especially for our support staff. Um, we are planning um, a six-part training, um, one hour each training session. They're going to be held Monday afternoons, um, where we have it built into our schedule right after our systems of support. Dr. Jubiel is going to facilitate this as well. And um, you'll see there's six sessions. We have the dates set already. The first one is taking place January 25th. So Monday is our very first DEI training. Um, the first one will be an overview of equity, um, equity 101. We'll talk about some vocabulary, um, what, what the language is behind this work. We'll go into understanding implicit bias um, in session two, micro, microaggressions in session three, social constructs of self, positionality and spheres of influence in session four, 
uh, stereotype threat, coded racial language in session five, and then finally in session six, six bystander versus upstanders and um, proactive solutions to incidents of hate. So, Michelle, mm -hmm. is this something that um, if anyone on the board would be interested, would it be something that we also could just um, tune into and listen? Or is this something that's just for um, the staff? Um, Dr. Dubio has a couple of different opportunities available. Some are for staff members, some are for board members. Um, we've been working, James and I, at determining which ones are the most appropriate for each, um, you, you know, each uh, um, stakeholder group. Um, I, I, I don't see that, but I do think that James and Yvette were talking about what to do with the board next. So I don't want to overstep with that. Well, great question, Juliet. I am in conversation with Dr. Dubiel in regards to professional development for for our board in regards to DEI. Um, we haven't ironed that out yet uh, and the timeline for that as well. So I will keep you posted on that, but that conversation is taking place so that the board uh, can have professional developments in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion training. So more to come there. Uh, thank you for asking that question. I know you guys are all inter are interested in that. Uh, so we will make that happen. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this, this um, training in particular, we're trying to target towards um, our staff, our administration, and all support staff that's directly involved with students. So although this is, you know, our first step in um, training, and there's obviously going to be a lot more along the way, um, even for different stakeholder groups, this, the, this one's a pretty big one, and that we're going to capture, you know, over... Um, probably around 200 members of our organization um, with this. And, um, but, you know, as we work through the equity action plan, we'll have a very clear and explicit manner of which we ensure that all members of the organization are trained appropriately and, um, you know, with the right content and um, with the right topics and, and um, approach. So, um, yeah, we're excited to get started. Um, you know, we we talked. To, our Delta team was meeting a little bit before um, Dr. Yvette started working with us this last week, and we said, should, should we start this um, now, or should we wait till the action plan is done? And they're like, let's go, let's do this. Our our, our staff is enthusiastic about this work. They're excited about getting started, and and you know, we're passionate about it. So. Um, we, we hope to learn a great deal over the next um, few months here. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, great. This leads us to our next topic here is a educational omnibus bill. I just wanted to make sure you're aware of it. This was uh, really supported by the, the Black Caucus as well as the Latinx Caucus. Uh, this legislation passed both chambers uh, and is waiting for the approval of the governor. The governor, uh, we believe, is going to sign this bill, and so therefore we need uh, to unpack it uh, when 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 it is signed. Uh, the provision of this bill include additional graduation requirements. I believe one of the uh, uh, provision is a, a, a foreign language, additional curriculum requirement requirement uh, events of Black History Month, uh, computer science standards accelerated placement program, which basically if you take a, a state assessment and you uh, exceed, um, meet and exceed, you are put in a rigorous class. Um, and also uh, underrepresented teacher recruitment and scholarships. So just wanted the board to be aware of this. It hasn't been signed yet, but this is something that the administration will uh, unpack um, when it is approved. Uh, next up is negotiation update. Just real quickly, met with Floss uh, last Friday. We are ready to go. Uh, schedule meetings on February 8th and February 12th. All right, thank you all. Uh, now we move on to the consent agenda. Does anyone have any questions? 
or anything they want to discuss regarding the consent agenda? No, I, I'm sorry, um, Jay, question about um, the, like the, uh, the speech team is still competing, obviously. Um, wondering um, like how some meets, um, there's more payment for some meets versus others, like um, you know, with Elk Grove versus Willowbrook, you know. 300 versus $800. Like how do we provide that many judges for those meets that they get paid for those events? Patty, you were getting cut off. Could you, could you ask the question again? Um, you know what? I, yes, I will. Um, we're, the speech team is being is still competing. And I was just wondering why some, why we're providing like, eight judges for one meet and, um, versus three or four for another meet. I mean, like were the, were the meets that big or that, that different that we had to provide more judges or just, I, I just kind of caught my attention. All right. I think I could answer that. And you'll you jump in here. It depends on how big the meets are and how many individuals I'm sure that this is virtually. So each for each topic, there should be a judge. I'm assuming if it's eight, one competition and three, another competition, it's really the number of students, I believe, that are participating. Jovan, any input? Yeah, I know that's, uh, that, that's uh, exactly it. So it's the size of the meet um, that matters. Okay. You have to bring so many judges because um, obviously they can't, they shouldn't be judging your students. They need to be judging others. So it's the, the size of the meet that goes into that. And we, we, um, we compensate our, our own judges for that. Okay, thank you. Oh, if you could restate that where we're at with the consent agenda. Sure. Well, I just ask if anyone had any questions or any comments regarding the consent agenda. Uh, good question, Patty. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? President Weedman, just wanted to remind the board the approval of the press policies. This summer we had that policy meeting. We went through the 22 revisions of policies. Most of them are end notes and uh, law notes there. Uh, that's why it's here in letter G. Uh, we asked the board in December uh, to, to have that first and second reading there and to be approved uh, here at this meeting. Just a friendly reminder what that is. All right, thank you, James. Um, yeah, if there's no other further questions, then... Uh, May I have a motion to approve the consented agenda as presented. So moved. Uh, thank you, Julia. May I have a second? Second. All right. Thank you, Patty. Roll call, please. Peyton Howell. Yes. Jalowick. Yes. Figaro. Yes. Rago. Yes. Ting Paul Pong. Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, motion is passed. We move on to the discussion action items. The first one is the resolution uh, authorizing preparation and publication of fiscal year 2022, <coughs> excuse me, tentative budget. So we are moving on already to next year's budget. Uh, James? I'm gonna pass it to Bruce. Uh, yes, you are absolutely right, Mr. Uh, Wiedemann. It is time uh, to uh, seek authority uh, formally from the board to begin the budget process uh, for next school year, the 2021-22 school year. Um, this is an annual uh, requirement uh, to officially establish the fiscal year and designate um, the administration to prepare the, the, uh, the budget and publish it uh, going forward. So. Uh, we're asking the board to approve the resolution to uh, authorize that to happen. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, any questions? Uh, if not, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the re resolution authorizing preparation and publication <coughs> of the tentative budget 
for fiscal year 2021 to 2022. So moved, Paul. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. And I'm sorry, who was second? That's Kid. Oh, okay, Kid. Thank you. Um, roll call, please. Peyton Hall? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rego? Yes. Ping Pong? Yes. Jalwick? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, then motion has passed. We move on to the food service contract amendment. Uh, James, if you could take that. Sure, this is another amendment um, in regards to our food contract, I believe is lowering our price. Bruce has more uh, uh, a concrete picture of this. Bruce, on to you. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Untangle. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, this is amendment number two, as it states there. Um, in, in October, not that long ago, the board approved an amendment to the uh, contract, uh, our first amendment, I guess, uh, as you would call that. Um, and that's for a meal rate adjustment. And part of their rationale for asking for an adjustment and increase was the fact that um, meal participation was low and production costs were exceeding uh, the cost of what they were getting uh, in return uh, from the district for the rate, the original contracted rate. ISB does allow for you to amend the contract. You have to go through a process and this is the process. So attached, uh, we've included that meal rate adjustment um, form that the vendor completes and then the district would sign off on and submit that to ISB to make it uh, formalized and, and approved. So, uh, but I'm pleased to report now that, uh, and, and when we agreed to the price increase, Arbor also agreed that if the pricing uh, was, uh, participation increased, their prices, pricing went down, they would lower the price as well. So that's what we have for you. Uh, participation, I'm happy to report, has increased. Their costs have gone down and their meal rates uh, will go down. So in e either case, you, uh, even prior to the First Amendment or this and this amendment, our reimbursement uh, is exceeding uh, what they're charging. So in both cases, uh, in this case, it's a little bit important and what it was the first go round. So um, it's just a process to, to approve this um, and, and submit to the certification, but we're recommending that the board approve the proposed meal rate adjustment. Um, and we'll continue to keep the board apprised if there's any other adjustments. Hopefully if we bring any more to you, they won't go further down. But uh, right now it's, it's good news that the pricing is going down uh, from them. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Jane. Um, and if, no, if there are no other questions, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the attached food service contract amendment November 1, 2020 for the meal rate adjustments uh, as presented. So moved. I second. So moved. Second. Yes, thank you, Juliet. Thank you, Kit. Can I have a roll call, please? Peyton Howell? Yes. Rago? Yes. Tipo Pong? Yes. Jalowick? You're muted. Patty, you're on mute. She's frozen. Um, I said yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, uh, motion has passed. Uh, the next item is, is a discussion only item regarding the review of the 2021-2022 school calendar year. Uh, James, please. 
Sure. We started working on our 2021-2022 school calendar. Once again, this is a draft uh, draft that we just wanted to present to the board. There's no uh, voting in this case because there's so much more to do. Just real quick here, the tentative dates. Uh, uh, it's start date of August 11th, similar to what we're doing now, and, and May 19th, similar for this upcoming uh, end, end of the year. Winter break, December 20th to December 31st, same month. And spring break is always the last week of March. Uh, this year is March 28th to April 1. Uh, the state uh, calendar requirements from ISB is 176 uh, student attendance dates. So we got to have to have those days. And the next step uh, before final approval uh, uh, by the board is feedback from our teacher, uh, from, from our different association, FEA, FLOSS, and our building administrators. Once again, that's a real overview of, of, uh, of, of the start date, end date, uh, end of vacation there. That's the most important thing. Just wanted to let the board know uh, that we're working on it and we're gonna bring it back uh, to the board for approval when we receive feedback from our association and our, admin our building administrators. All right, thank you, James. Uh, any questions regarding the calendar? Okay, then we'll move on to the committee reports. Uh, the first one is the Bensonville Community Foundation, uh, Juliet or Kit, anything new there? We have a meeting coming up on, uh, on Philly Thursday. Uh, nothing new unless you have something to add. Uh, Kit. Nope, just just that we're, we've got a meeting coming up, so we should have some to report next month. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next is the Finance Facilities uh, Committee. Uh, we had our Finance Facilities Committee meeting today. We covered uh, building projects, summer projects. Uh, the mid-year financial update is presented by Bruce. Sam gave, a, gave us an overview of the building and summer projects. Uh, Chromebooks presented by Jim. Uh, Stimulus Funding Cares Act by Bruce. Um, organization was uh, introduced by Sam, then including also the exhaust system, seal coating and tuck pointing uh, items also. So those were the items covered in the uh, Finance Facilities Committee meeting today. Uh, Marianne, I don't know, do you have anything more to add? I do not, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the IASB delegate, uh, March 20th is the uh, DuPage Division dinner meeting. Well, it'll be a virtual meeting. Um, it's it, for the first time. It'll be on, on, on a Saturday. Uh, Mary Timmons will send. The, I believe she already sent the invitations for that, so that would be a great meeting for us all to attend. Uh, again, that's on a Saturday, uh, March twentieth. Uh, Lend. Um, James, do you have anything on Lend right now? We have a meeting. Leo and I have a meeting this Friday uh, morning at eight o'clock. Leo, if you cannot make it, I will represent uh, the district for us, uh, but I'll give you a briefing. It's the first council meeting, uh, first meeting for this uh, new elected body. Okay, thank you. Uh, NEDSEC, um, Leo? We don't have a meeting until next month. Until next month. Okay, then we've got Upcoming things, uh, items next month, and we'll be hearing on. All right, good. Um, policy committee, Patty or Kit? Nothing new. We've already done our policy <clears throat> updates, and uh, we voted on the policy updates today. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next board meeting will be Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. Um, so if there's nothing else new, we will move into closed session. 
Then may I have a motion and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public, public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee of a public bo body that is su subject to the local government wage increase transparency, transparency act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with this act 5 ILCS 120-2C1 and collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or the representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees under 5 ILCS 120-2C2. So moved. Uh, thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? Second. Second. Okay, thank you, Kit. Uh, roll call, please. Peyton Hill? Yes. Ting Po Pong? Yes. Jalwick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, Jim, if you could let us know when we are in closed session. Rowan. All right, you got the right wires connected? <laughs> All right. Okay. Then may I have a message? Um, Motion uh, and second to adjourn. Come on, Patty. I make a motion. I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. May I have a second, please? Well, Kit seconded, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kit. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Hill. Yes. Jalwick. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Rago. Yes. King Paul Pong. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe. Have a good night. And uh, we will talk to you later, okay? Okay. Good Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.